Well, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 7. We want to look at the 12th verse uh, together this morning. How would you sum up 2020? I remember coming back from uh, representing our church at the Synod of Dutch Churches in, in Amsterdam in January. And I met some Chinese friends at Dublin Airport. And they were telling me that this coronavirus that uh, had been discovered in Wuhan was very, very serious indeed. And it was just beginning to be reported in the news and didn't know what to make of it. And they were warning, saying, this is, this is going to be a big problem. And they were right. And that's what 2020 has been about. It's been about coronavirus. It's been about lockdown and masks and 2K travel limits and 5K travel limits and stay within your county and don't meet people in your homes and meet them in your gardens and then don't meet them in your gardens and restrictions imposed and restrictions lifted and then imposed again and fear and worry and perhaps frustration and disappointment. That's 2020, but what about 2021? How are you feeling about 2021? Is there a sense of apprehension or a sense of frustration? Well, whatever way we're feeling about 2020 and 2021, there are seven words that we can write over the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. Seven words that redirect our attention. Seven words that give us a hope-filled focus and which help us to look back with thankfulness and to look forward with confidence. And they're found in our verse, second, first Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. And I think we should take this verse, and not just the children write it out, I think we should all write it out print it out and place it in our eye line. Maybe put it on the fridge door um, so that we see it regularly. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. And if we remember this verse, there will be two things that will help us do. It will help us in the first place as we look back. It will help us as we look back. This verse comes at a key moment in Israel's history. As we look back over the chapters, there's been, in this chapter, a significant victory. A decisive battle has been won. But what makes it significant is that on this site, back in chapter 4, 20 years previously, there had been perhaps Israel's greatest defeat. Their greatest defeat. Their greatest defeat would remain their greatest defeat. I would say right up until the Babylonians came and took them into exile. It is a catastrophic loss. It is the lowest point in their history so far. They'd come into the promised land and things had gone well. And then they'd turned away from God and things went downhill. It became darker and darker as they go through the book of Judges. And then we come into Samuel. It's still set in the time of the Judges. And the man of God. Eli, well, he's a mixed bag, isn't he? He's a very weak father. He tolerates his son's wicked ways. And yet he has a seed of faith there in him. He's able to direct Samuel well. But his sons are not a mixed bag. His sons are utterly godless men, wicked, depraved men. And yet they are the priests. And the people are far from God. And God is going to use the, the enemies, the Philistines, to discipline the nation. As we look back to chapter 4, we find the magnitude of the disaster. They went into battle and they, they lost 4,000 men. And then they thought, oh, we forgot to bring the Ark of the Covenant with us. Now, they were meant to bring the Ark of the Covenant. That's what God had told his people to do. He was 
to go at the head of the armies that went into battle, a reminder that God would fight their battles for them. But they're not doing that because they're looking to God as the great God who they were trusting. They were treating the Ark of the Covenant like a, a lucky charm. Oh, we forgot our lucky charm. We'll, we'll bring the Ark of the Covenant with us and then we'll win. But God won't be played for a fool. And he stands back and the Israelites are defeated. A further 30,000 are killed. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, are killed. Eli dies when he hears the news. And as if that isn't bad enough, what makes this utterly catastrophic, the Ark of the Covenant is captured by the Philistines. And as you look at chapter 4, if you turn in your Bibles to chapter 4, you'll find that the this is underlined for us. It's repeated four times. If you look at verse 10. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And then verse 17. We read the same news. It's repeated. A man brought Israel or brought the news replied. Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. And then down to verse 19. Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery when she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured. There it is again. And that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She went into labour and gave birth, but was overcome by her labour pains. She too dies. Tragedy again, but we're, it's repeated for us. The ark of God has been captured. Then verse 21, we're told she named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Why? Because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. Do you see? Catastrophe. Twenty years previously. And now, two decades later, there has been a glorious reversal. On the same spot where there has been defeat, there has been victory. And why? Why the change? Has God changed? No. God doesn't change. We read in verse 2, Then all the people of Israel turned back to God. The people changed. And Samuel calls them to assemble as a nation and he will pray for them. And the people respond in verse 4, And, and they put away their false gods, we read. And as that's happening, as the people are getting back on track with God, discouragement comes. The Israelites, or the Philistines, get word of their gathering. They must think it's a rebellion. And so they gather their troops and they march. And as we come to, to verse 7, we find the Israelites terrified. Terrified because of the Philistines. But what do they do? They don't look to themselves. They ask Samuel to pray to the Lord for them. Here's their trust. And verse 9 Samuel cries out to the Lord. And verse 9 tells us, And the Lord answered him. But look look at the answer as it's set out in verse 10. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord. But that day the Lord. What great words. But the Lord. They could be written over 2020, couldn't they? COVID-19 came, but the Lord. Lockdowns came, but the Lord. Restrictions came, but the Lord. Fears came, but the Lord. Our God was there. What do we read here? But the Lord thundered. That's all. That's all. He acted. He was their help. The Philistine army scattered, confused and panicking, and they were routed as the Israelites joined in the victory that God had already given. 
And then we come to our verse, verse 12. Then Samuel uh, took up a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. Thus far has the Lord helped us. The stone is set up to be a reminder to them of the amazing help they had received from the Lord. Chapter 7 is like the reverse of chapter 4. It's the undoing of it. Here, there's a name given. Chapter 4 finished with a name being given. The glory has departed. And now a name is given. The Lord has helped. The Lord has helped. The glory has returned. And the purpose of setting up this stone is to direct their focus. They had been relying on themselves, but now they've been trusting in God. Thus far, the Lord, the Lord has helped us. It's to remind them to keep their focus on God. It's to remind them of the stunning power of God. To keep their focus on that. It's to remind them of the surprising ways of God. The Lord helped us. There was thunder and the Philistines fled. And they're to remember what happened at that spot. So much so that it seems that that very place became known as stone of help, Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Because they're going to need to remember it because in the ordinary humdrum of everyday life and daily, weekly, yearly problems, our memories fade and this sort of thing gets forgotten about. And yet there's going to be a big stone pillar in that area that every time they walked past it, every time they travelled as they journeyed and saw it, they would be reminded, thus far has the Lord helped us. It would help them to look back. And we need to look back over 2020 and remind ourselves Thus far has the Lord helped us. He's helped us as individuals. He's preserved us. He's sustained us. He's provided for us. He's answered our prayers. The very fact that we're still here is a reminder to us that thus far the Lord has helped us. He's helped us cope with pain. He's helped us cope with disappointment. He's helped us cope with discouragement. Thus far has the Lord helped us. And he's helped us as a congregation. We can write, thus far has the Lord helped us over 2020. Our various means of worshipping throughout the, the year, online, thus far. Oh boy, can Johnny and I say, thus far has the Lord helped us. Um, how relatively trouble-free our online service has been. Yes, there have been some teething problems, but given what could happen with broadband and internet connections, God has helped us wonderfully. And you've been able to be fed by God's word in this way. Thus far has the Lord helped us. And then our drive-in services, a location and the technology for that to work. Thus far has the Lord helped us. The meetings that we've had in person although they're fewer in number this year. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. He's helped us in feeding us from his word each week and in our Bible studies. He's helped us stay together as a congregation. He's helped us by opening a new and exciting possibility for a venue for our church. Thus far, has the Lord helped us? But You know, I think for the people of Israel, and for us, it's more about just looking back over an immediate moment. I want us to notice two things before we leave this first point. Thus far points to God's long track record of help. Thus far points to God's long track record of help. Till now, some versions have. Till now, but from when? From the day before the battle? From the day they started to repent and turned from their false gods to the true God? Was it the last two decades since the ark came back from Philistine territory? 
was it longer, thus far? We can go back further. He had brought them into the promised land. He had helped them in the campaign to capture the promised land. Thus far, the Lord had helped them. He had sustained them through many attacks in the, in the book of Judges. Thus far, they could say, the Lord has helped us. But longer. They could go back to the wilderness wanderings. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. For 40 years, it helped them. They could go further back still. He brought them out of Egypt. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. He had been with them in Egypt. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. He had been with Jacob, and before him Isaac, and before him Abraham. Thus far, the human race could go back to Eden and say, as God closed Adam and Eve, instead of striking them down, thus far, has the Lord helped us? It stretches back through the ages of their history. He hadn't just helped them this time, but many times. And so it does for you. Thus far stretches back, back over 2020, back into 2019, 2018, 17, 16, back. Some of you can look back and there have been particular years since the turn of the millennium that you would write in block capitals, thus far the Lord helped. Then you go back further, back to the time when perhaps you came to faith. Thus far, the Lord helped. But go back to Calvary and to Bethlehem and to the councils of the Trinity before time began to tick. Thus far has the Lord helped me. Thus far has the Lord helped you. Thus far has a long track record. And the second thing to note before we leave this point, thus far points to God's help, not just through hard times, but by hard times. Not just in the hard times, but by means of the hard times. Thus far. I think Samuel isn't just saying that God has helped us by bringing us out. God's help had been there, not just bringing them out, and not just in the hard times, but through them. God didn't suddenly start helping on the day of the battle. God hadn't ignored them for the 20 years. God wasn't ignoring them back in chapter 4, whenever they were so catastrophically defeated. Why were they defeated? It was because God was seeking to help them. That was God helping. He was disciplining them as a father disciplines his children. He was humbling them for a reason. There's a lovely verse in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 16. I, I was nearly going to preach on it this morning simply for seven words again. Seven words at the end of the verse. Moses is reminding them what God did for them. He says in verse 16, Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you. Remember how they had to keep gathering. and They had to trust him that he would be there the next day. Not to gather for the next day, but to trust him for the next day. It was to humble them, not to look to their own resources. And it was to test them. That he might humble you and test you. And then these seven words, To do you good in the end. He tested them to do them good in the end. He made it difficult for them to do them good in the end. And the same in chapter 4. He brought the difficulties to do them good in the end. And we could write that over 2020. Another seven words. 2020. To do you good in the end. And that's what he's been doing here. And that's what he's been doing with us. Not only can we look back and say that God helped us in the hard times, but we can say God helped us by means of these hard times. Maybe you've grown through this strange year in ways that you wouldn't otherwise have grown. Maybe you've discovered truths of Scripture that have been more precious to you this year than before. Maybe you've found God closer to you while you've been isolated. Maybe you've found as you've been praying that he's 
you've had a sense of him hearing. Even if he hasn't yet answered, you've had a sense of him hearing. You've had a sense of him being a shield and a, a support to you. Maybe 2020 has revealed things to you that you thought really mattered to you, but now you find that they don't matter so much. Other things matter more to you. Maybe it's revealed uh, things to you that once did matter a lot, but now God matters more to you. Your relationship with him, your trust in him matters more. Maybe it's drawn you closer. Maybe it's opened your eyes to riches in his word. I loved getting verses back from, from you and from the, the Letter Kenny congregation last week and seeing such a range of verses um, that spoke to my heart about what God had been saying to you. It was beautiful. Maybe he's opened his eyes to riches in his word or riches in his world as we've explored and appreciated our county around us and seen uh, wonders uh, and richness there. God helped us by means of the hard times to appreciate him more. And how many times has he done that? Many of you who could write in block capitals over particular years in the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, thus far as the Lord helped us, particular times, you can bear witness to those hard times being times by which God has helped you. And maybe as yet, we haven't seen all the ways by which God has helped us with what happened in 2020. But we can be sure that thus far, by those hard times, by means of them, he has been at work, strengthening, building, purifying, pruning, enriching us as his people. And so we need to remember to look at what God is doing in us in the hard times. That's what this stone would call the people to do, to remember that God didn't stop being their help. And so we can say, thus far has the Lord helped us. The first Sabbath of the new year is a good time to look back at the previous year and to acknowledge that God has helped us. Let's maybe take some practical steps to do that. I've talked about the children. And they could make a little photo montage of some of their favourite memories of the year and write, thus far as the Lord helped us. Well, if they're doing it, we could do it too. We could use that to weld it into our memories, to etch it into our hearts that God helps his people. We need our Ebenezers, our reminders, amidst the humdrum of life. That we can look at them and say, no, whatever's going on, thus far the Lord has helped. So pick some 2020 Ebenezers. I'm sure some of you already have Ebenezers, stones of remembrance of the Lord's help from other points in your, your lives. But have some 2020 ones. It might be a verse that has helped you through the year that you... Uh, write out or print out and stick to the fridge. It might be <clears throat> that you get somebody who's particularly crafty, good at craft, and they make a, a coaster or a piece of fabric or a picture with the verse on it, or maybe you can do that. Or maybe there's something that God has done for you. Maybe it's... Um, some reminder from the natural world that gave you light and hope in the midst of 2020. Why not take that and make that your Ebenezer, print it into your mind, print it on a piece of paper, stick it up, and so that you see it and you're reminded. Thus far has the Lord helped. Use it to remind you of the power of God, the help of God, to keep you focused on God. Whatever 2021 brings, at us. Have many Ebenezers. Keep your gratitude fresh. Keep it up to date. Make a list of things over the next few days and, and take time to, to jot down the things that God has done. In fact, you know, you could even get a, maybe you have a spare diary for 2021. 
what a thing to do is maybe to pick up a diary in the January sales uh, and, and to, to, to write down on each day a list of the things that we want to give thanks for, to train ourselves to remember what God has done. A few years ago, I sporadically started to do that, and I found and this old journal recently with this list in it. And although it was sporadic, it got up to 200 uh, items, in small print, squeezed in on pages, things that God had done that those months. I wasn't even consistent over the year, but to look back, wow, what an encouragement of a God who continues to help. And that brings us to our second point, and much more briefly, as we are helped to look back, we are also helped to look forward. We are helped to look forward. Samuel didn't simply set up this monument to remind the people of what God did in the past. This isn't a celebration monument. You know, England won the World Cup and back in 1966. They haven't won it since. Um, and a huge mural or a, a monument could have been put up to that victory. But it has precisely zero help for future generations. English football teams lost in 1970, 74, 78, 82, on and on and on and on and on. The past was no help for the present. But Ebenezer isn't about that. Unlike the English football team or its opponents, God doesn't change. God doesn't weaken. God doesn't deteriorate. Circumstances don't arise that are too much for him. The stone was to be set up to remind the people that God, who has helped them in the past, will continue to help them. That when the children ask them and they have to explain this stone is here because God is our help. And there was a day when we were all quaking in our boots as the Philistines marched towards us and we could hear the tramp of their boots shaking the ground. God shook the whole earth with thunder and they fled before him because our God is our help. What would those children think? They would think, well, you know, that God could be our help. And whatever troubles we face, whatever circumstances we face, they would think, you know, for decades to come, for centuries to come, that stone would be a monument to them, not just of past help, but present help. And as they would fear, maybe they would hear the tramp of the Midianites or the Amorites or the Philistines again, they could look at that monument and go, our God will help. Our God will help. And that's what Israel celebrated over and over again. We sang from Psalm 121. My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. We could have sung from Psalm 124. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We sang from Psalm 63. For you have been my help. We're going to sing from Psalm 33. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and shield over and over and over and over again. And we read from Hebrews chapter 2 and chapter 4 about our high priest who sits on the throne of the universe. Our Jesus, who has come and lived here and who knows what it's like and the pressures we face and the temptations we grapple with and the frustrations and the pains and the anguishes, he knows it all. He's been here. He sits in the throne of the universe, ready to help his beloved, blood-bought brothers and sisters. He's ready to help, able to help, willing to help. This is our Savior. We need to be reminded of this so that we can look ahead with confidence. God would continue to be Israel's help. Because as Malachi would record at the end of the Old Testament, God's words, for I, the Lord, do not change. And although 3,000 years have passed since Samuel said this, God has not changed one iota. And our Savior sits on the throne, helping his people as he has done for the last 2,000 years as the risen, ascended Savior, the high priest who knows and is able to sympathize, and the mighty God who is able to help. That's what we've got. So we can face 
God's people can face 2021 with confidence. Whatever happens, we can be sure of God's help for us as individuals, for us as a church. It would be easy for the present problems to take our focus from God. So that's why we need to have our our Ebenezer's, whether it's a verse stuck to the fridge, whether it's underlined in our Bibles, whether it's a stone set up in the garden, whether it's a picture of the spring flowers poking up through that, that give us a, a sense of hope before, they, before they've even arrived, whether it's a picture of majestic Errigal or the, the coastline of Donegal that we remember that the maker of this is our help, whatever it is. We need these to help us to remember that God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Psalm 46. We don't know what lies ahead. It may be illness, it may be accident, it may be financial burdens, it may be problems within our families, or 2021 may be a gloriously wonderful year. We just don't know. 2021 may even be a year of hardship and gloriously wonderful. It might even be the year when it's our time when God calls us home and that will both mean hardship and something gloriously wonderful. We don't know what this year holds. What will it mean for us as a church? We don't know. But what we know as individuals, what we know as a church, is that God will be our help. We will say at the end of 2021, what we say at the beginning of it, thus far has the Lord helped us. You can be sure of it. You can be certain of it. It was Samuel's experience, Israel's experience. It's been the people of God's experience. And as we look on in the chapter, we see that God enabled Samuel to keep going all the days of his life. God helped him. Sometimes help is powerful thundering. Sometimes it's steady plodding, but God helps none the less. And so we should expect his help. We should have confidence as we face 2021. God helps us no matter what. And perhaps you're watching this morning, and this seems a bit foreign to you because you're not yet trusting in Christ yourself. And maybe the prospect of 2021 concerns you. Well, what do you need to do? You need to find the God who will be your help in 2021. You need to do what the people of Israel did here. They turned to God and they found that God was their help. You need to turn to him. We read in verse 6 that they confessed their sin. We have sinned against the Lord. They had pushed the maker of heaven and earth to the side. They, They had lived life without him. And now they're acknowledging we were wrong. We had other things that were more important to us than you, God. Forgive us. And you need to do that. Make 2021 the year when you confess that you've ignored God. Make it the year when you turn to God and you ask him, as it says here, turn with all your heart, a wholehearted turning to God and entrusting yourself to him. And if you do that, asking him to be your God and your saviour and the one who forgives you for all that you've done. As you entrust yourself to him, you will be able to say every day through 2021, thus far has the Lord helped me. It's no small thing to be a Christian. You get to say, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And we get to write over every day, thus far, as the Lord helped me. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you for these wonderful words. Thus far has the Lord helped us. And we can say them with thankfulness as we look back over 2020. Yes, it had hard things, but yes, abundantly yes, the Lord has helped us. And we thank you too that we can say these words with confidence as we look over 2021, that we know that the Lord will continue to help us. And so, Lord God, help us to 
have our own Ebenezers, our own monuments, whether they're in paper, whether they're uh, on pictures, whether they're in the garden, whether whatever it might be, reminders to us, whether we, we just start making a list of all the ways that you have been a help to us day by day and chart our Ebenezers through 2021 the way sometimes we've charted the figures of, of transmission rates. Let us chart your help, Lord, so that we might be encouraged, excited and delighted to face the year ahead, knowing that our God will help us. And Father, we pray for those that we know and love who aren't yet able to say that. You've been helping them nonetheless, but it's not that their Lord has, has done that. They don't have that saving relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would bring them this year into that saving relationship. They would acknowledge all the help that you have already given to them, your stunning patience and mercy, and they would come and put their trust in you. Let 2021 be that year, we pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen.